can go from there. Okay. I'm going to to try to keep the co-host unmuted, or if you have the ability to mute yourself or anything like that, let me know. First off, everybody, oh, there's Sheila. I'll let her in. I want to thank everybody for making time. I know this is a... <laughs> Ooh, unusual times indeed. I think when we sat down and envisioned something together, this was not what we had in mind. Um, but I wanted to kind of, um, there's an agenda online for anyone who wants to go for it. And um, I want to thank first and foremost, um, Shane, those of who haven't had a chance to meet her. Um, Shana Bruden has been added to the executive team at CSD with Dr. Duty. Um, it's absolutely amazing. Oh, well, there she is. Um, and <laughs> helped put together and um, helped us put together, you know, I don't know how to start it, but at csdicator.slash page slash 4212. I don't know if there's an easier way to find that. Um, but there's a lot of documents there that I'll be referencing as we begin to talk about before you can find the most recent um, version of the Georgia State study, um, the actual text of the senior exemption legislation. Um, it's where you can also find um, the Tableau tool um, where you can sort of play with the variables, whether they're age or um, income restrictions, et cetera, to see how they impact stuff. And you can also see the charge. Um, I kind of skipped and Lewis usually does this, but I guess we have enough people. I, we should begin with a call to order here um, and, and do that. So uh, call to order for the committee. We have enough people to do that. Um, so you need a second. Is that okay? Call to order. And I think for call to order, we don't need a second. Okay, fair enough. Um, so the goals for today are to introduce the charge publicly, have it recorded out there for what the purpose of the committee is, an introduction of the people who have volunteered for their time, um, for the committee themselves to pick a chair for it, uh, go over the outline of the time frame for it, and then to set the future dates and the future meetings for what we are going to do. Um, in terms of goals and the introductions, we had decided that there should be nine members of the Decatur community to represent and achieve what is in the charge, which is that we believe that the exemption should be extended in some form or capacity, um, but should be done so within, within reason, that there should be caps and done so with a way that is tested. Uh, the original community in Decatur voted for, for there to be a million to, I believe, um, and Heather knows the exact number, it's in the original legislation, a one to two million dollar tax exemption for seniors. Um, and the problem when it tested is that we didn't necessarily have the data to support what that exemption would be. Um, we now would like the committee to put their brains together um, to come up with ideas for the best way to put um, maybe limits or guidelines in place to let us know what the best way to uh, bring to the Georgia Assembly uh, an exemption that can allow us to not have the exemption go into uh, the stratosphere, but can allow seniors to continue to um, age in place and continue to do so. Um, the charge then says that you should elect a chair, um, bring back to us by September 1st of 2020, We've not revisited that date since, you know, schools were canceled. Um, something for us to discuss, I think, as a board. Um, then a proposal that is willing to be sunsetted uh, within five years, if needs be, um, another senior homestead exemption that would allow seniors to continue to do so. The board would like to then take that to the Georgia Assembly representatives and senators. We have, have been discussing a plan in place on how that that could be extended. Um, we want you all to continue to have public involvement and follow the guidelines of an open chair committee. That is your charge. Um, so I'm open for questions, particularly from the nine members that we have here, or at least the eight that I see publicly questions for the board or for Dr. Duty, and I know Heather and Lewis are here as well somewhere. 
um, to answer questions that you all have for us. The links that you were referring to um, on the lovely page 4212, um, mm -hmm. they all revert back to the default page zero, so it doesn't go anywhere. It has been, that has been. I'm sorry, say that one more time for us. That has been fixed. Okay, then I need to do a hard refresh on a browser. Thank you. Yeah, I checked that out this morning because I and then I sent that link to. Awesome. Okay, I stand corrected. Thank you, Shauna. I appreciate that. I, I hadn't I hadn't done a hard refresh on the browser. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I don't know why it's not allowing that. Let me try unmuting you here, Hans. <laughs> um. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, thanks. Can you hear me now? Yes. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I think my first question was whether uh, the, the original objectives of the exemption still stand. Presumably they do, but maybe it would uh, help to start from setting the stage for, for why we were choosing to do an exemption in the first place. Yeah, the, we discussed in the charge, um, the public record of the discussion. So um, we want an exemption so that seniors can continue to age in place. Um, we feel that rising housing costs um, create an incentive for selling houses. Um, we've seen an exponential increase in student growth. Um, uh, I, I would like for this Q&A for you all to give us questions that you all want data on. It's one of my goals. I probably should have said that out loud. Um, Dr. Duty, I sent him an email and I haven't followed through on what questions do you all want that on, but we know that there's been a massive increase in the number of students attending CSD schools. One of the original intentions of the legislation was to keep the number of students um, down. We're going to seniors if they continue to age in place means that it's not replaced with students for whatever reason. Um, and so that purpose is there. And also just not putting pressure on, on seniors where they feel like happily because their tax raises go up. Um, is there another purpose of the legislation that you're concerned about, Hans? No, I, I just I thought that that you know setting guiding principles for the conversation and, and and the reason why we did it in the first place will help us frame the questions a little bit more uh, specifically to uh, what the options may be and and really what we want the outcomes of those options to be because I don't I don't at least from my perspective I don't feel like those two objectives really have changed. Yeah, I don't think that they've changed. I think that the the committee charge also includes a discussion of equity, um, the racial dynamics of increasing housing prices, the way that that is forced uh, certain sections of the Decatur population for the pressure to put on them. Um, I think that needs to be stated openly. Uh, we think that uh, the increasing housing prices has caused um, certain dynamic of developers to aim towards particular places. Um, that's all mentioned in the beginning charge, the whereas is parts of legislation that um, Lewis really got into. Um, and that's all spelled out at the top of it. Um, this is, Dr. Duty and I had good email conversation about this, I don't know, what, six plus months ago easily. Um, and I, so I decided to take a look at this report with just fresh eyes and not worry about anything that I'd done before and just start to read it. Um, is, the, is the underlying data in the Tableau tool, is it the same as the data that was used to create the report? Is there any difference between those or is it the same data set? That's, it should be the same data set. They did have to process the data in order to create the Tableau tool. Um, they basically have a massive database that covers all of Metro Atlanta. 
and they um, filtered that down to the specifics of what that tool was designed to do. Um, and so as we go through and choose those options in the Tableau tool, um, they have done calculations on the back end for every combination of factors. And that's what the Tableau tool, tool is pulling up is those calculations. Okay. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to go digging into, in too deep at, at this point, but there's, I do have some data questions that I will, they're not complicated. They're not half as complicated as what I sent to Dr. Duty last time, but uh, <laughs> there's a, like the, in table two, there's just numbers that jump off the page that like a single sale would be for 15% of Decatur. And so that I, I think maybe they didn't trim the, the outliers on the two ends before and it's, skewing it so that we have a, a, a mean uh, sale of 5.1 acres. And uh, we all know that it's just not, not reality in, in our world anyway. So, um, and it may just be that they're just extreme outliers and they're skewing the, the, the rest of the stuff. So something for us to at least look at. If, if there is math, particularly as it goes into one of the variables um, that you want myself or a member of the board to email someone who puts it in there uh, to verify, please, you know, email us or, okay. or the, the members of the study or, or do something like that. I mean, okay. I think some of the data points that go into the tables, you know, I know that those have been some questions, whatever, and I know that those raised and stuff. I didn't, you know, how those impacted the variables that went into the tool that I didn't see how those connected sometimes, but if there's a question about one of those variables, I'm happy to get an answer or we need to get that fixed for sure, Paula. I don't want to okay. play with faulty man. Yeah. No, no, no. I, and, and I agree. I'm just saying that, that it jumped off the page at me that 19 million, acre, 19 million square feet is a, you know, that's 450 acres and we haven't seen a sale like that. And <laughs> I don't even know when. Gotcha. If, if I could ask, one of the things that jumped out to me on the report was that um, despite the exemption, uh, municipalities in the Atlanta region, were some of the benchmark municipalities they looked at in the Atlanta region had precisely the same rates of seniors leaving their, their homes as we'd experienced in Decatur, even post exemption. And so I'd like to know if we have any information from any municipality, not, not just in Georgia, but anywhere where a, um, effectively a tax rebate actually moved the needle on, on shelter, you know, on, on aging in place and folks staying in their homes. I mean, are we, are, fundamentally, are we trying to move the wrong tool to affect the outcome that we want? Like Lewis wants to answer that based his violent hand way. Give me just a second, Lewis. David, do you know, can you unmute Lewis? Again, you. yep. There you go. Can y'all hear me? Yep. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. And and first, I'll just repeat everybody's thanks for your willingness to serve on this committee. It's very much appreciated. Um, and I, I think <clears throat> from my perspective and from what I understand the board's perspective to be based on the discussions about forming the committee, um, I want to, or at least I would suggest that we move a little bit away from focusing on the value of the GSU study as a study of the actual effects of the tax exemption and moving the needle to answer Han's earlier question on the, the two uh, original purposes for the tax exemption. Uh, you know, the GSU study concluded that it didn't have any effect that was measurable, at least with the amount of data that we had. Take that for what it's worth. It, we are not suggesting to eliminate the exemption, and we're not really relying on it uh, too much, except for the tool that they've given us, the Tableau tool, which they created for that study, which is now uh, the tool that we've got to turn the dials of an exemption in terms of age limits and um, value limits to come up with an exemption that will meet our budget. 
And so the reason that we need to limit the exemption is that we can't afford it as it's currently configured. We need to put limits on it. And so that's just the budgetary reality. The question then is what limits should we put on? What's the best way to equitably distribute the $1.2 million that we've allotted to senior tax relief? Because um, there's different ways that you can do it. And, and I think what we really would like is for this committee to put its heads together and say, here's a good set of limits, um, you know, in terms of what would the appropriate income limit be? Is an income limit even the right tool? Would it be better just to limit the total value of the exemption? Should we give everybody some small exemption up to a certain point and then give people with limited incomes a larger exemption based on value? All those kinds of questions are what we're really looking to the committee to come up with. It's fine to probe in or dig into the study, but I just wanted to suggest that, that in terms of correcting their findings, really that's not gonna make any difference at this point because we've chosen to, number one, keep the exemption, but number two, limit it to its, its total cost to the system to what we put in the resolution. So the question is, given that budgetary cap, how do we design it? Did, did that make sense? Yes. Makes sense. I've got a question and follow up sort of to that and sort of stacking a question on what Hans raised. Um, if we're not sure of the utility of, of the effect of this and we are just proceeding with keeping it, I understand trying to tweak it to enhance it. Do we have tools available to us to consider for how this might be a part of a bigger, like how is this connected to other things the city of Decatur is doing? Because if we're looking at it in isolation, and this is one tool that we can use, and it doesn't seem to be doing what we want it to do. I don't want to go beyond the scope of what we're called to do, but I think that information is, if what we're being asked to do is kind of look at what's in the box and maybe shake it up a little bit, figure out another way to configure it, understanding, and this is my first committee meeting, I've not been involved in the previous conversations. Any like sort of background information on what else is available or how this is connected to other things that parts of the city of Decatur are doing, would be beneficial to me if we're being told to also sort of not <laughs> not utilize the DSU report as sort of a guiding document or not put too much emphasis on it, I guess is what I'm hearing. I'm curious if if any of uh, any all some of you have read the uh, the affordable housing task force report that uh, was delivered to the city. I that's really sad since I was part of that and I don't remember what month it was but it was in the late fall uh, mm -hmm. and um, it's a whopper I won't kid you it's it's uh, it's about 90 pages um, and what I think if I understand Hans what you're trying to ask and and also Meg what you're trying to ask is um, should we should we look slightly broader to see if there's a different way to affect the, the outcome we're trying to affect so uh, we we did a lot of digging for that for the task force, so I would suggest that that is certainly a, a an, an item for review. Yeah, and if I could if I could expand on on I think my question, um, if if fundamentally the case is that a, a a tax credit or an exemption in this case doesn't have any impact that we can determine anywhere in terms of aging in place. Then, then perhaps that's not the purpose of the exemption. And we should communicate clearly that the purpose of the exemption is more along the affordability, which is in fact what I heard Lewis say, we have a limited amount, so how do we equitably d distribute it? Uh, you know, that immediately brings up the question of affordability, right? And, and so I, I think that if we're not talking about it, in those terms and we're not clearly communicating that that's perhaps its new purpose and that it, it, it may be a part of a set of policy initiatives that are being taken within the schools and the city uh, to try to address affordability. Then, I mean, I just, I think that that's, um, from what I heard Dr. Duty say and what Lewis say, it isn't any longer about aging in place and, 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 and keeping seniors in, in Decatur. It just, it didn't work. And so what then is it about? And, and that's, I just wanted to make sure we were clear on that as we, as we talk about the potential levers that we pull. 
Well, I, I think Lewis is saying that he doesn't want the committee to get into fights about the statistics about whether it did or didn't work with studying in place. And Hans, you asked a question about whether we have data about whether senior tax exemptions do or have ever worked with places. And there are literally rings of study from congressional bodies, Georgia state bodies, municipal bodies about whether they work. There are a whole other sets of stuff, including some stuff cited by Paula's group and the task force for affordable housing that says that targeted ones that focus not on, you know, uncapped everyone over a certain age gets it versus something you all can propose where it says maybe an income gap or uh, maybe up to a certain value of a home does where it means that, you know, if you can afford it, you can afford it, or you can, you, you know, lowering it does the barrier um, that can do stuff. I, as what I hear I'm saying is that there are ways to write it that are data driven um, that can achieve both, right? That can ultimately allow more seniors who will be at the threshold to do that and then be making that choice. And then that intersects with equity in some very important ways. So let um, me, let me Meg, ask just that. very briefly, can I, I just want to, I, I do want to answer that. Meg, I'm, I'm totally with you. And one of the things that I asked and Heather Tell provided for me, um, and I will make sure that it gets added to the thing was a list of all of the exemptions that currently exist in Decatur because there are more than just the senior homestead exemptions that are available for seniors. <laughs> Um, and Lewis had shared with me that not all seniors apply for them, not all of them are taken, et cetera, but there are a lot of them. Um, that'll be added to the website as well, because I think that that's a really important question, like what else is available? What else do people have and as part of the larger question? I right, have a question. Um, can you all hear me? Sheila's here? Yes. Yeah. So this is my first committee meeting um, as well, and I'd like to get some data as to why is it that we can't afford it? I understand that we have to stick to a budgetary perspective, but for me, I am looking for, you know, why is it that we cannot, which gives me a little bit more clarity as to what am I looking for, what questions I need to ask to help figure out how to make it affordable, if you all understand what I'm saying. Yeah. One of the things that we tried to look at also was the, with the task force work was if it does go away and, or it is a substantial change and, and then people start, we do see an exodus because, um, and then we start flipping the houses from empty nesters to now children, more children in the system. We have to find a, a, an interesting balance in there so that that, basically that we, we don't uh, become a victim of our own success once again. So um, I, I think it's a critical question that we need to be asking. I, I can't count how many people have come up to me and said, if, if, if this goes away or if it's substantially changed, we're gonna have to leave. Um, and given the way that property values have escalated in the past, you know, eight plus years, um, Lots of folks have big prop property tax bills that they didn't have not that terribly long ago. One other point that was made, I believe it was made in the task force report is that a lot of it, so you can only peg an exemption to age, income and property value. Those are the only three that are allowed. And um, some of these exemptions for the city went into effect in the eighties and, and, and then on, but none of the income levels, the qualifying income levels have been changed since that date. So, if you stop and look at that, it, that's a huge uh, dollar gap that it is, it's a head scratcher. When it's not, if it's not tied to AMI and instead it's just a fixed number and it, it doesn't get updated, then it, it, becomes, uh, it, it becomes not useful very quickly. Paula, I Can I interrupt just for a second? I, 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 the school board spent a lot of time writing the resolution and I'm a little worried that we're going to easily want to stray from um, kind of what their vision was for how to do that. So I do want to share the um, the resolution and the piece. Um, hopefully you can see it. I'm sharing that on my screen um, about what the committee is charged to do. And they spent a good bit of time thinking through this. Um, 
So the charge of the committee is to develop the rec recommendations by September 1st um, for the senior homestead exemption. And they tell what it is they're looking for there and to um, implement a public involvement process for giving, getting input on that. Um, and the focus, they really were focused on, um, if you look in number eight there, that using those levers that are available in the Tableau tool, the age income exemption amount, and um, ensuring that the impact um, as projected in that tool doesn't exceed $1.2 million at the end of that five-year period. Um, so I think um, part of the reason they put so much time into that is because they know there's a lot of directions that this discussion can go and they really wanted it to be very focused on exactly what it was they were looking for. So I do wanna share that because um, I think this is, it, it's really easy if you go down a bunch of different rabbit holes um, uh, and have a lot of discussions that aren't actually what the board is asking for. Um, so I just wanna share that so that we all know what the resolution said that established our committee. If, if I could take that exact point and go to the, the part of the question that I was asking around the efficacy of, of exemptions in general around uh, promoting aging in place. Mm -hmm. the, the reason why I ask, if we have to fit this into a $1.2 million bucket mm -hmm. and we aren't seeing an impact, so let me say it this way, if our focus continues to be aging in place, then I might look a little bit more heavily at what is the age of the individuals and, and perhaps the combination of their age and home value to see if we can target it against those individuals specifically to keep them in the Decatur community. But if instead we have determined that there is no data anywhere that indicates that that would actually work based on our experience here and based on other experience. And instead we're actually looking for something that is more specifically related to income to promote income diversity. We might target who it hits in that case a little differently. We might be looking a little bit more at income level as opposed to age. And, and so that's where I, I, I suspect we're gonna be in a position where we're having to pick between those two. And so I'm trying to, or, or not, you know, absolutely, but some balance between those two. And so trying to get an understanding of, of whether we are still truly focused specifically on aging in place, or have we absorbed the lesson and said, you know what, it didn't work. And we don't identify anywhere else where it has worked. So now we're actually going to, pr you know, promote income diversity. Uh, those are two different levers that we might, that we might, move on. And so based on the information that I saw from that study, it doesn't look like it works for promoting aging in place. And I might be more indicated towards promoting income diversity indicator instead. If you're saying though, that we actually have a lot of information that indicates that a more targeted one would actually help people age in place, then, then that would be helpful to know as well. If, if I may, uh, I think that your question is very well put yeah. and I can, you know, we've got three board members on the call. Y'all speak up if you think that I misstated, but I think we absorbed the lesson and I think that we were still committed to providing tax relief to seniors. But I also think that in forming the committee and I appreciate David, you're putting the uh, resolution up on the board, you know, we made a decision that we could afford the $1.2 million. Uh, the reasons for that decision, that's a long discussion that we can have, but it's not really the focus because the board has already decided that the budget is the 1.2. <clears throat> the idea with the committee was then to distribute that tax relief with flexibility that the committee, I think, I think you know we're very open to the committee's priorities. We worked hard to get a broadly representative group of people to serve on this committee. And I think that the board generally would be uh, amenable to um, hearing the board's, or not the, the committee's uh, preferences and priorities in terms of how to distribute the money. I do not think that we're stuck on necessarily uh, the 
limiting the growth in enrollment at this point or in promoting seniors to the ability of seniors to stay in place because as you said the gsu study said that didn't pan out um, at the same time we're committed to providing tax relief i think we're as focused at this point on equity and income diversity and all types of diversity and um, we're also of course interested in in helping seniors to stay in place and i think that all you know housing affordability i think that all factors in and we'd be interested in a balanced approach such as the committee thinks is appropriate i do not think at this point that we're focused on limiting the uh enrollment in students i think that we're just accept the lesson that that's not that this tool didn't work maybe it did maybe it didn't but right now let's focus on an equitable distribution of the 1.2 million dollars in tax relief I think that's an important point too, Lewis, um, that the, one of the biggest conclusions of the report was it did not control enrollment. And so you'll notice that in this charge, it doesn't say anything about enrollment and that's why. And not to be a, stick, not to be a stickler here, but if it, I'm looking at number eight and if we are being asked to use the Tableau tool, which I love by the way, it's a great BI tool. If the underlying data has any issues to it, then we're not gonna get a reliable outcome. So I. I'm going to now be quiet about that henceforth and forevermore, but. Um. Well, and I'll, I'll share, Paula, we did do some um, kind of um, reasonableness testing on it of running some parameters that we felt we had a pretty good understanding of the impact and the, the values were reasonable. Um, and so we don't, we don't have a reason to question the, the underlying data um, that's feeding into it. Um, so just so you're aware, we did do some checks on it. Hey, Bill, I think I see you talking, but you're, you're muted. I don't know how to take There you go. Now you're Sorry. good. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, and I apologize, but I've got to get on a conference call with the CEO here in just a minute. But I did want to add some comments just from a historical standpoint, really. And I, one thing is, and I'm not, I don't put a lot of stock in that report. That's one thing. And I know, I'm, that's because I don't understand it. That may be more anything else. But I know that when you do something like this, you really don't know the uh, the effect of it until you do it. And I think you're, even though you try to use some sort of tool to set it at 1.2 million, you're probably not going to come up in a half. It's probably going to be something else. And then once people see how to adjust to it, they're going to adjust and the number's going to change. So that makes me think that you need some sort of adjustable tool, if you will, if in fact that's the key to what you're trying to do is maintain your loss of revenue at 1.2 million. Now, if it is an issue, the school board have avoided for years I know you're talking about it now but you need to come up with some sort of proposal if that's what you're looking for you could increase the three million dollars you lost to a different program now I know I'm straying off from the from what this thing is I'm trying to read right here but I'm I'm I just think you I think if you're if you're shooting for 1.2 million and that's fine, okay? I don't, I don't think you're gonna know the impact of it until you do something. I mean, I just, I think if you, if you try to set the income level and, and how you set the income, I don't know, it, it, as I guess the city does that, uh, what qualifies as income and what doesn't qualify as income, there's all kind of stuff like that. And I think this committee's got to get into an answer, but I think to get in and come up with something that looks reasonable and then do it and see what kind of impact. And, and that's a good point, Bill. And that's exactly why the board included number seven there in the charge um, about the five year sunset, because we did learn from this that our original estimates were not accurate um, and they ended up being much different. 
Um, and so they, they definitely appreciated that there was this sunset. So there was a designated time to revisit and, and make adjustments as needed. So that's one of the reasons that number seven is there. I, I think that, that yeah, no, uh, I remember when we did the earlier, the, the first one, and, and that was, I know Elena Parent had a lot to do with the fact that they had a, a five year sunset on it at that time. And I, I do think that's good. I wish there were some way, I know probably there's not legally a way to do that, that the school board had some way to make an adjustment on a every third year deal or something like that. If there's some way, you'd probably have to write a new law rather than just this kind of thing. But I think Lewis, I think you guys need to think about that, is putting together some sort of program where you have some sort of tool that you can adjust this as you need to. And then I I can tell you this, and I'll stray off of this, there's a lot of conversation going on about new cities and whether to, a lot of that kind of stuff going on right now, which is gonna change the way the city of Decatur is gonna to have to look at the territory around it. Now the schools may be excluded from that, you can't exclude the schools, but that's something that you guys have got to get into and understand and that something's gonna to have to be done there in the next three or four years. So I'll make that comment knowing that's, that's another issue altogether. I think I, I've heard now, I mean, Dr. Payton brought this up and I think I just heard in some of the subtext of the comments, sorry, I have a two year old coming up here next to me. So bear with me if I get interrupted. Um, I, some question about whether or not, um, whether or not we really and truly are, we're understanding for the purposes of this committee, we're limited to the 1.2, but whether we really and truly are in the long run limited to the 1.2. And I know that's outside of the scope, but I do think that that should at least get uh, recorded as one of the outputs of this conversation is that there's several folks on the board and I'd add my name to that, um, willing to reinvestigate whether affordability is really limited to the 1.2. Um, the, the other point that I was going to ask, I guess, or just put it out there for the group to respond to is that if we are limited to 1.2 and we are looking at uh, trying to promote diversity within Decatur, there's a, a big effort underway around affordability already within Decatur. Is, is income, when we talk about income, particularly with retired individuals, income is awfully limited in actually identifying net worth and the ability to afford. And, and so when we, when we say income, are we actually talking about the range of what we mean in terms of, of wealth or are we talking about truly just annual income to an individual? I, think to I, add I can to the hit that too. I, I do think we're talking about it in the means of what they mean with exemptions, which there are definitions of what we mean by income, right? And that's one of the reasons that often exemptions look at property value rather than income, because you can have some very wealthy people who have very fairly low levels of income as defined for exemption purposes. So that is definitely something the committee will want to take into account. I would... I I think to add to the conversation about what the what the housing task force did, the affordable housing task force, I don't know if you recall, um, Paula, our max, but one of the biggest things that came out of that was the fact that there are a lot of people that are really benefit, well, in this regard, benefiting from the exemption that are a part of what our missing middle was targeted to be and found to be and where we are greatly laxing in opportunities for people to own and or rent. And so I think a lot of the a lot of the results that came about from that task force work can be applied here um, because I do believe the maximum income that people were making where they were not afford, able to afford to live here was about that max that's plugged in on the tool at 76,000. So I think that in aligning with trying to preserve affordability indicator in spaces that can be preserved um, and then making it possible for people who are living here to not be pushed out and we keep that middle, we, I think that the, whatever, we, whatever income is defined as, right, whatever we figure out the income definition is when it comes to exemptions, that really needs to be 
I think really looked at my opinion. I totally agree about the income. I mean, and to, to speak to your point and the intersection with seniors is that once you, once you hit retirement age, what your income is has nothing to do with how wealthy you are. Your, your income can be, can be non-existent. Uh, you can report losses and, and be, and be incredibly wealthy and, and property value. And I think that that's one of the reasons a lot of the literature that I've come across says some of the better ways to do it, uh, it being create exemptions for, for tax stuff has to do with the value of the house, not anything to do with the income gap because seventy six thousand dollars is 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 a medium income for uh, someone in their thirties, uh, but for someone who is retired, bringing in seventy six thousand dollars, yeah, that doesn't make much sense. Um, uh, I, someone else, uh, Hans, you're one point two million, and and this speaks to something that Bill Floyd said when when dealing with it, and, and many of you are far more intelligent about budget stuff than we are. I, I think that we all recognize as a school board, I mean, particularly because we're dealing with, with housing values, we're dealing with not knowing the number of people who will become 65 and begin to take the exemption. Uh, 1.2 million is, is the goal. And I think we all realize both that's the purpose of the sunset um, and Lewis and Heather can, can speak up with me as well. That, that number is likely is a target. And I think we all expect that target to be um, aspirational. I know it would likely go up. It will likely be able to be revisited. Um, when we put the first tax exempt, senior tax exemption in place and, and um, Sheila, Dr. Payton, this is what, to answer your question, uh, when, we voted, when we voted on it, we, uh, the first one as a city, it was for a particular target based on what we thought exemptions were gonna be and how much revenue we were going to lose based on very limited data. And then um, when the tax revenue came in, it, it was a far greater loss in revenue based on the exemptions. And so when the school board sat down um, in the past few years in terms of the money we needed per student, um, uh, the, the millage rate needed to go up in order to continue to pay teachers and continue to run the buildings, et cetera. And so could we afford it? Yes, but who was paying it needed to change. And so when the affordability task force sits around and talks about who's paying bills, the bills have to get paid. It's just a question of, of where, where those bills get paid. And so 1.2 million is something that we all, I think unanimously agreed based on the votes of the city, we should aspirationally aim for with a sunset, with a, with a realization that, I don't know, you know, None of us knows that that's where we're going to hit it, but we should try. Lewis, is that fair? Yes, I think that's fair. the 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 one thing I, I mean, <clears throat> right, but that that is why we specifically put in the resolution that we want to use the tool that we had GSU develop for us. Paul, your point's well taken, that if the tool's not good, we've got a problem. And so if we do have problems like that, let's continue to surface those and we'll take them to GSU and try to get an answer. <clears throat> but uh, we want to use, we want the factors to be able to insert, insert those factors as input into that Tableau tool. And that's gonna be our best indication that what we're doing should have that $1.2 million impact. If we miss the mark, we'll readjust at year five. Um, and I don't know that we can do any better. I'm very interested in um, uh, Bill's idea about some kind of an indexed, ex and someone else mentioned it, if we could have some kind of a way to, an, an adjustment that you don't need legislation in order to adjust, in order to, I don't know how to do that. I, that, Gwen, might be something that, that you, uh, have some insight on whether there's some way to make that happen um, that, that you could have kind of a self-adjusting exemption. The, would... the, the, the Affordable Housing Task Force tried to get an answer to the question of can you tie it to AMI, to area median income. Uh, we mm -hmm. never got a clear answer on it, but if, if, if that can be done, I mean, logically it makes sense because it's something that's indexed every year. It's, we don't have, nobody has to do it. It's, it's you know, fortunately, um, Somebody else in the world takes that on. But if that's the case, then that would be a naturally 
adjusting um, space or, or number to use as opposed to, like I said, you look at these that Dr. Duty has up now and, and you look about, you know, in 1995, uh, an income of $40,000 is definitely way off the mark in today's market. So. Um, a lot of cities and counties around the state have homestead exemptions that we call them floating homestead exemptions, where basically the, for tax purposes, the assessed value was frozen as of a certain base year. So you could say, you know, 2020, the, for tax purposes, your assessed value is $300,000 going forward into eternity. So, so there's that kind of freeze, but then you can actually, a lot of them have a CPI adjustment that they put on that. I don't know if anyone's using AMI, but I, I know a lot have a CPI adjustment. So if in 2021, the new assessed value is $350,000, they're not taxed on that additional $50,000. They're only taxed on the 300,000 for as long as they own the home. Um, I mean, you know, certainly there, there are policy issues with that that I won't get into, but that is, when I was looking at this tableau, that's one thing that I, I would like to see to play with here because I think that is a way that you can, you can grow the exemption amount over time in a manner that is consistent with, with CPI. Um, and also you're not locking anything into, you know, this hard and fast 50,000, 75,000, 100,000. You have that wiggle room and so you're not necessarily dipping into existing revenues or what were existing revenues before 2017 but you're saying you know going forward we're not going to increase your taxes based on digest growth we're just going to increase taxes that would require a millage rate increase for someone's taxes to go up so that kind of mitigates the initial revenue hit and allows it to grow more over time and generally those are limited to like seniors or the, the exemptions are defined around individuals or the entire digest? Um, it depends. I mean, it's all, okay, one, only homesteads. So it certainly wouldn't go beyond your, your homestead digest. Um, some that I saw, and it's, it's been a few years since I've really been immersed in these, but yeah, you know, there were a lot that were just seniors. You see them on the city and county level. Sometimes they're for everybody. Um, I think that's where you get into your really concerning policy issues because you've got an inequity in, in what people pay based on how long they've been in their home. Um, when you're dealing with seniors, I think that, you know, especially if you're starting at age 70 or beyond in particular, but maybe even at 65, you're mitigating that inequity a little bit just, you know, because of, of age, truthfully. So I have less concerns about that, that inequity there than I do if you were to apply it across the board to your entire Homestead Digest. Uh, agreed. I, I know that California had to do a resolution mm -hmm. to eliminate their cap that, that they yeah, had. Yeah, the top 13. Yep. Yeah, and Columbus has something similar and it, it Columbus, Georgia, and it, it was a problem for them. So yeah, I don't, I don't like to see it digest wide, but it might make more sense actually, um, especially if you're talking about putting an index on it anyway and growing that 1.2 million over time, it might make sense to just say, here's your base year and going forward, we're gonna have a CPI growth. Um, and having the CPI growth truthfully helps mitigate some of the inequity as well. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask kind of a, cl a clarifying question maybe, uh, just to think about, right? Because I know we've talked a little bit about in terms of income and property value. Um, but, but, and, I, and I haven't played hugely with the Tableau tool, I have to admit. So school me if this is something straightforward within it. But what we're, you know, you can, you can envision two different individuals, one on a fixed income in a home that they bought 40 years ago, that's now $600,000 of value and they struggle to afford the property tax on that particular home. Uh, and they have, their fixed income is, you know, a low number, tens of thousands a year. You could also have an individual whose net worth is $10 million, who withdraws a very small amount of money of that against it, who has just purchased their $600,000 home in this living indicator, and by no means would need any of the exemptions that we're providing. But their income and their home value 
would put them in the exact same bucket as the other individual I described a second ago. And so we're in a situation where it's really not income, it's not property value, it's net worth that we're really trying to, to get at. And, and, and more specifically, relatively liquid net worth. Um, because that the first person that I described on a fixed income in a $600,000 home really doesn't have any options in terms of trying to generate more income to cover the tax base that they're having to deal with with that property. And so how would you, with the Tableau tool or any of the policy tools that we're putting in front of us, differentiate between those two individuals? I really like that example. Thank you. I am, feel like we've uncovered a lot. I'm, we're getting close to six o'clock. I want to see if anyone is interested in being a chair, um, set a date for future, see if anyone has any ideas other than publicizing our meetings um, for ensuring public involvement, um, or if they've thought any more about ways to make sure the public feels, um, and then, also, yeah, right now I have as my to-do list, make sure that the Tableau tool gets emailed out to the members of the committee. Um, make sure that the committee has a list of other things that are being done around the cater. Um, um, work with Dr. Duty to get a list of the numbers about both what we can do, what we can afford, as well as the student growth stuff. Um, contact Georgia State about adding a property value freeze tool um, that Gwen mentioned um, to the tableau. What else? Um, this is Heather. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? This is Heather. Yes, Heather. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, first time I was thinking about volunteering with the Honest Committee and just to say it's so important that we have your expertise here and we really appreciate your time and your involvement. Heather, I don't think you're really coming through. Yeah, yeah Heather, you're breaking up now. Can I call in? Yeah. Okay. I don't have the number. I'll text you the information. Okay. Well, while we wait for Heather, I have a suggestion, um, okay. which is that I think there are a lot of questions um, that the committee has about the purpose and scope that we tried to work through in the resolution, but might not have succeeded. And yeah. it, it might be a good uh, exercise for you guys to ask those questions to the board. Um, so that we can answer them. And I've been a little bit uncomfortable doing that because, you know, it, it's a board and so we have to sort of work based on what everybody agrees to. Um, and we don't always have the same opinion about it, but if y'all were to serve up the questions, we could, we could collectively put our heads together and generate answers and turn them around so that y'all could, you know, move forward accordingly. Um, so I might suggest that procedure. Well, then can, can I add my question that I asked before we went off to James's list? What, what I would like is to understand at a policy level what gets us closest to net worth, since that doesn't feel like an actual index that we can go off of. What, wh where has that appeared in policy within this, obviously because it's within this state, um, to help us guide what levers we might pull? That's a great question. Um, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Okay. I, I'm sorry for that. I just wanted to thank everyone, first of all, for being on this committee and for your time um, and for helping us with lending us your expertise. Um, I think looking over the resolution, um, as Dr. Duty pointed out, will help us remain focused. We appreciate and understand that this is a very broad issue and it can and it can, you know, it really can take on a life of its own. So um, I, I do 
appreciate also that several of you have been involved with, on a city level. I think it would be a great idea for everyone to read the task force study. Um, I think it was, maybe it was Paula or Meg who mentioned that. Um, so James, if you could maybe add that to the list just to add to the available resources. Um, and I think that we also mentioned sending out a copy of all of the school and city exemptions that are currently existing, just so everyone can review um, all of the exemptions that are there because they all, you know, together make a, a cumulative impact for our residents. So mm -hmm. looking at those, um, all of those together would, would also probably be helpful as we have these discussions. So thank you very much. Yeah, Hans, I, I had that down less as something that I can answer and more as a charge for you all to answer. Like, I have no idea what the best target for an actually working senior tax exemption that achieves equity in a meaningful way to help people um, with their tax exemption through a school tax is, but if this committee can even dent that, um, that would be amazing. And um, I was overwhelmed as I began to look through stuff. I mean, there's congressional reports, there's Georgia municipality reports, there's some that I think there are studies that they have definitely been successful at reducing it, um, at, at reducing you know, senior turnover in certain cities. Um, so I don't know. What, so, do we want to wait until the purpose and scope is answered or do we want some working orders um, as a committee for the next three or four weeks? I like the idea of purpose and scope. I kind of need a base where we're working from and why so that I can, that's just my opinion. Okay, I will resend that email with the charge in it as well as these other things. Um, and we can set another meeting date with to do's on it. Um, um, out of curiosity, would it be helpful to just have an idea of the different methods of homestead exemptions the General Assembly has passed in the last couple of years? Yes. Yes. Quinn, is that something you are saying you have access to? Yeah, yeah, it's all on the um, General Assembly legislative website. So I can I can look through and come up with some, I'm just, I'm flipping through it now because I was looking for some language about the CPI increase. And so I wanted to build it, did that, and I found it, but I also found some other ones that I thought were creative. So I can pull some of them. And could someone help me understand the values in the Tableau tool, are they assessed or appraised? So at the, the actual home value that we're talking about, is that, is that based on assessed at, you know, 50% of, of appraised? It looks or is to that, me like it's assessed it, under it, under the definitions for exemption okay. amount. It says maximum amount of a home's assessed value being exempted. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so Tableau toll emailed out, um, list of exemptions and other things being done by CSD, student growth and other numbers, the floating homestead exemption that Gwen mentioned, um, a purpose and scope email that you all can ask clarifying questions a beginning conversation about what gets us close to net worth, which is on your larger question. And Gwen, you can reply with the different methods of exemptions that have passed. Am I missing anything before we adjourn? Could I, could I request, um, we, we, we have email addresses from everyone kind of lumped together, but it's sometimes difficult to decipher the email yes. to attach it to a person. Um, Hans, I, I, I was just thinking we'll we'll set up a generic email address group that goes to everyone on this committee, um, kind of like we do for the board. We'll get that set up and shared. Great. The, I mean, well, the other thing is, like, if I had specific questions from individuals' expertise around the group, I would love to know 
who to reach out to. The other thing, this is a little bit more minor, but it, it's probably worth correcting. I'm listed as a municipal tax expert on the website. I am not a municipal tax expert. I am a municipal finance expert. There's a giant difference <laughs> between those two things. But um, yeah, it just I think that also having a little bit of an understanding of everyone's background would help us as we're reaching out to folks for support. Yeah, my yeah. description on that same page made me laugh so hard I had to just like get a tissue. I was like, oh, what? seriously? Would, would you James, all locate did you, your... Did you say that you were also going to speak um, or going to find out confirming that $1.2 million, if that is how realistic that is when we talk about inflation or, you know, other numbers changing, how hard that is for, say we set a sunset clause for five years out. Would that number ever budge? Yeah. Will you put that question in your scope so the board can answer that question for okay. you? Um, I will tell you, we discussed it quite a bit around the board table, and um, there were some pretty strong feelings about 1.2 million because it's even specifically written in the resolution as 1.2 at the end of the five year period. Um, so that is something that has come up, but we can certainly discuss it again. And if you will all just look at your descriptions on there, I think that that was something Shane and I, maybe our wires were crossed and, and your descriptions and your titles. Um, I think Paula, I, you know, I'm sure I had no idea how you're described on there, but uh, happy to update that. I've right. done, a, I've done a lot of things in the world, but I've not done that, but it's okay. I will send it to you. I'll be happy to do that. Okay, and we will plan for a next meeting in the next couple of weeks. I will also include that invite. We put anything on there we want. If we put anything on there we want, I might want to elaborate a little bit more on mine. <laughs> At this point, you can put anything you want. I think people would believe it, Bill. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. I got to go, guys. Let me know what you need me to do. Sounds good. Okay. And everyone has my email, or you can email the board at CS Decatur um, by net if you have any specific questions. And I will try to get this out um, by lunch tomorrow. Um, so thank you again for your time. Woo. Good luck working. Thanks, guys. Thank you Thanks all. everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. We'll consider the meeting adjourned. I'm stopping the recording. <laughs>